The Edwardian era was a boom time. The wealthy social elite was wealthier, more social and more elitist than ever before. And they set about indulging their senses in all areas of life, so that everything they did became an exercise in luxury. And I want to see how a bit of that luxury can transform an ordinary day. Edwardian country house, extravagance and formality started with the very first meal of the day. I've come to Simpsons in the Strand in London, which first opened its doors in 1905 and still serves up authentic Edwardian breakfast dishes today. I've never been one to stint on the first meal of the day, but I have to hand it to the Edwardians for their attitude to breakfast. This looks more like six Sunday lunches with a couple of fish suppers thrown in. But if I was an Edwardian gentleman, this would be just an average start to another day. The challenging feast included such popular dishes as bubble and squeak, black pudding and grilled kippers, not to mention a couple of hefty joints of meat. A choice of exotic fruit was more a demonstration of wealth and status than a healthy alternative. It's a pretty big commitment to get to grips with such a breakfast, but an even bigger one to set about preparing it. Executive chef Richard Blades is clearly championing a return to a more substantial start to the day. I guess the great British breakfast was probably never greater than when the Edwardians were eating it, but you seem to be flying the flag pretty well here. You, you believe in breakfast? I do. I think the most important thing was that, in fact, there was variety so that people could pick and choose. So what of the Edwardian breakfast dishes do you think are due for a revival? Things like devil kidneys, pig's noses and parsley sauce. Say that again? Pig's noses and parsley sauce. Really? Yes. They have their roots back in history because, in fact, there was the requirement to use everything. Mm. And it was a case of, well, what can we do to it? Or how can we make it palatable? It's fun to go back and read old cookery books, Isabella Beaton, Mrs Marshall, um, even Escoffier. Those books actually contain the roots of a lot of the dishes that we've had now, which have actually changed and developed as time has gone by. But it is fun to go back to the roots. Richard's Kedgeri is one of the finest I've tasted. So what's his secret? A lot of people tend to mix either curry paste or curry powder into their dry ingredients. We make a curry sauce, albeit a mild one. His curry sauce is made from onions, apples, curry spices, a little fish stock and a lot of cream. It's wonderful colour, really rich and creamy. Yeah. So what else is going to go in here? Right, well, we've taken the rice, we've mixed the curry sauce into that. I'm going to put a, a few raisins in to sweeten and balance. And then, last of all, I'm going to add the uh, smoked haddock. Stir that in. Eggs. We're not going to put the eggs in at this stage. Right. We tend to put those on the top as the last, at the last so moment. So it's more of a garnish? As a garnish, yes. The next thing we're going to do to that, we're going to season it. Just basic salt and pepper. We're going to transfer it into the serving dish. We're going to peel the hard-boiled eggs and put those across the top. Shall I give you a hand with them? Please, if you would, yeah. There's four for starters. Thank you. Kedgeri is an Anglo-Indian recipe born when colonial officers persuaded their Indian chefs to combine their own rice dish with the beloved kippers they had sent over from England. And it's deservedly become a classic. Looks lovely. Thank you. After breakfasting like a king, I'm ready for my next appointment of the day at Edward VII's own barber's. Like roughly half the adult population, my day usually begins with a ritual that's frankly long since lost its charm, shaving. But I'm hoping that a more Edwardian approach to the chore will transform it from a tired routine to a pampering pleasure.
The Edwardian gentleman would certainly never have dreamt of shaving himself. His valet attended him in the comfort of his own bedroom. I'm going for the next best thing, the services of professional barber Camille Ozturk. So here's your hot towel. The hot towel. Is that something I could sort out for myself at home? Very easily, actually. You wet a towel, wring it, scent it with a nice flavour, put it in the microwave on two minutes on very high. <laughs> in the microwave? Microwave, two really? minutes, very high, and it'll come out beautiful. And what's this going to do for my skin and my bristles? This is actually going to soften your bristles and make my job a hell of a lot easier. While the hot towel works its stubble softening magic, Camille prepares some shaving lather with a traditional badger hair brush. The brush lifts and exposes the bristles and exfoliates the skin. A natural soap continues to soften the bristles and is less harsh than synthetic shaving foams. It takes a little bit longer, I guess, than just squeezing it out of the aerosol, but you think it's time well spent? I shave every morning this way. It doesn't take me very long at all, seven minutes. Before the disposable razor was invented, shaving meant using a cutthroat blade. No surprise then that any man who couldn't afford a barber usually opted to remain bearded. I'm not sure I really dare take a six inch cutthroat to my face when I'm sleepy in the morning. But what are the best alternatives for me at home? Well, it's all in the preparation. Hot towels, softening, lavering. Doesn't matter what razor blade you use you can get an amazing shave. Which is a cold towel, which yeah, is yeah. going to close all your pores. Is that coming out of the fridge? It has a lid. A final bit of pampering completes the experience, which has convinced me to trade in my aerosol for a bit of badger. That feels very good indeed. How does it look? Very close. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. I reckon I've scrubbed up pretty well. And since I now have the face of an Edwardian gentleman, perhaps I should consider smelling like one. There are a lot of fragrances that we use in Edwardian times. There's something quite typical might be the limes cologne. Oh, I like citrusy flavours. Just rub that, rub your palms together and have a little... And sandwood, mm. it's incredibly fresh. We put that on the hot towels when you're having your shave. Mm. It just really wakes you up in the morning. One of the other fragrances was very popular was sandalwood. Plenty mm. of base notes in yeah, that. That's lovely, actually. Yeah. Very nice. What else have we got? These are quite beautiful. This aster, quite a strong fragrance, because in that time, they tended to commission the fragrances just for them. But this was actually commissioned for Lord this, Aster. Yeah, this was Lord Aster's. Whew, he liked the strong stuff, he did, Lord like Aster, did I think I prefer the sandalwood, actually. I, I think for you, certainly the sandalwood, it's lighter and it's fresher. It's got far more modern scent. And limes. Limes is great in the morning. Sandalwood, perhaps, in the evening. Let's take these. I'm going to round off my wonderfully indulgent morning with a little light lunch. Another favourite dish borrowed from the Edwardian breakfast repertoire. Deviled kidneys. It's a one-pan affair, and it's all over in a few minutes. Take four lamb's kidneys, cut into quarters, with the whitish core trimmed out. Heat a little oil in a small frying pan, and sizzle the kidneys to brown them for just a minute. Then add a generous slosh of sherry. Let it bubble for a moment, and follow up with a more modest splash of wine or cider vinegar. A little red currant jelly adds sweetness. The devils in the Worcester sauce, a good pinch of cayenne, a blob of English mustard and plenty of black pepper. Season with a pinch of salt, then take the edge off the fire with an enriching spoon of double cream. Bubble and shake until nice and glossy, and serve up with fried bread to give it a bit of crunch and mop up the sauce. A sprinkling of parsley tops off this punchy little dish. These take about the same amount of time to make as a fried egg. Devilishly easy, and they taste heavenly.
perfect pick-me-up at any time of day. The owners of the great Edwardian houses didn't want to be dependent on outsiders for their luxurious lifestyle, so their country estates became mini kingdoms with huge kitchen gardens, stable blocks, walk-in ice houses and even their own beehives, which did a lot more for them than just put a bit of honey on the table. Amateur beekeeping became hugely popular with the Edwardians and they celebrated honey's versatility by using it in all kinds of products, both practical and luxurious. James Hamill is an American who's lived in this country for 18 years. He's a third generation beekeeper and is still producing honey using Edwardian techniques. The formulae for many of his products have been passed down to him from his beekeeping grandparents. James believes passionately that old-fashioned recipes and treatments using honey are still worthwhile today. It kills bacteria. It gives off a natural form of hydrogen peroxide, so it's good for wounds. An old Edwardian recipe for a facial mask was just literally to cover your face with honey. Uh, you can still do this. It's, it's really good. It, it, it opens the pores and removes the dirt. The technique of beekeeping, did that change at all during the Edwardian era? Well, the Edwardians really were in the forefront of beekeeping, as it were, and passed down what we now know today. Prior to that, the uh, bees were just kept in a basket type of shape, and really there was no access to actually manipulating the bees. The bees would then have to be destroyed in order to get the honey. I mean, here's an Edwardian hive. Oh, this is the real thing? This is. This is an original one. And here's the technique. I mean, basically we have frames inside. And these are what changed everything? Exactly. They're, we're able to pull them apart without disturbing or killing the bees. So you can get quite a lot of these frames into one hive and e each one is essentially a rack of honey? That's right. Now I know how the hives work, I feel ready to get a bit closer to James's bees. And this is all full of honey. This is a solid frame. Ah, and full of bees? Yeah. Wow. Close enough, perhaps, to pinch a bit of their honey. So let's just take a big chunk of that out for you. <laughs> wow, look at that go. James's bees feed mainly on the apple blossom of the orchard he planted himself. And you can definitely taste it in the end product. Mm-mm. Oh, it's wonderful. Very yeah. aromatic. Yeah, it's mm. amazing. Great stuff. Doesn't get much better than that. I've got something else for you too. It's got some beeswax. Oh, great. I thought you might be able to use that around the house to find something to do with it. I'll be needing some of your family recipes then. I'm afraid I can't give you any of my secret family recipes. My grandmother would, would shoot me. Really? So I'm going to have to work it out for myself? Yeah, but I'm sure you're going to come up with some really interesting things to do with it. I'll see what I can do. Okay. A hundred years ago, beeswax was a highly valued commodity. Besides being an essential ingredient in beauty treatments and cold creams, it also had dozens of household applications, from polishing furniture to nourishing leather goods like boots and riding tackle. This sticky lump of wax was clearly a vital and versatile substance around the Edwardian house, with the potential to make all sorts of domestic tasks easier and more pleasant. I can't wait to put mine to good use. But since James is so reluctant to reveal the secrets of his family recipes, I'm going to have to look elsewhere for guidance. And historian Daru Rook is just the person to help me. Daru, I've managed to acquire this stuff at great personal risk to myself, and I'm dying to do something useful with it. What can I do? Well, the easiest thing you can make is furniture polish, and for that all you require is grated beeswax and some turpentine cooked in a double boiler on the stove. That simple? It's as easy as that. Get grating. 
Okay. And we want nice, discreet shavings of wax that will melt down nicely. How do you think this old-fashioned technique compares to the sort of modern furniture polished products that you get? Well, it's so easy to make and it just contains natural ingredients. I mean, a lot of modern polishers have silicones and things in which aren't terribly good for the furniture long term. This will be used very sparingly, however, and a lot of it's about the labour of putting it on, which is quite pleasurable in its own way. Was there anything else done to en enhance the pleasure of these products? For upstairs folk, they often added uh, lavender to the furniture polish mix, and that would make the wax polish give a fragrance all its own when you were, were dusting the rooms. That would sort of be like an air freshener for the benefit of the upstairs, not to make the job more fun for the servant. The needs of the servant didn't really enter into it. The finely grated beeswax is put into a double boiler, or a heat-proof bowl over a saucepan of simmering water. Enough neat turpentine is poured in to just cover the beeswax and the mixture stirred continuously until the wax has completely melted. So it's starting to melt now? Yes it is, yes. Mm. The rather lovely smell of beeswax is a little bit overpowered by turps at the moment. You'll find that the beeswax will start to reassert itself, that's good. Perfect. Once all the wax flakes have disappeared, the liquid is poured into a jar and left to set. I'm standing well back at this point. <laughs> oh, gorgeous. What do you think? Looks all right? It looks perfect to me. A similar process, but a different set of ingredients, will transform my remaining beeswax into something rather more indulgent a rich and nourishing hand cream. Melt the beeswax shavings over a double boiler as before, but this time add some almond oil and olive oil. Once the wax has melted, trickle in some glycerin. This gives the hand cream a smooth consistency and helps retain moisture in the skin. To make your hand cream smell as wonderful as it feels, add a few drops of your favorite essential oil, in my case, lavender. Keep stirring until smooth and creamy, then pour into a jar to cool. So have you got any other Edwardian household cleaning tips up your sleeve? A lot of the stuff you could find in the Edwardian kitchen was ideal for cleaning. I mean, if you take a lemon, for example, chop it in half and add salt, you've got a great cleaner for things like brass bedsteads. And if you add vinegar instead, you can clean marble. An onion, that if you chop it in half, is great for removing stains from your boots, and a potato is almost as good. So, almost everything you have. Which weapon do you want to choose? First off, I want to put my homemade furniture polish to the test. And it seems to work a treat. But Daru is obviously keen to expand my cleaning repertoire. A hundred years ago, patented cleaning products were only just starting to be introduced. Most people still relied on stuff you could find in any kitchen. Salt and vinegar wipes away any trace of last night's excesses. A dab of gin takes the stains out of silk. Lemon mixed with vinegar really is a great all-round cleaner. The onion brings my shoes up like new and the potato works its promised magic on the mirror. Tip-top results all round, without the need for harsh chemicals. How satisfying is that? The hands of drudgery need a little reward. A homemade beeswax hand cream, no less. Have a sniff of that. Oh, that's gorgeous. Go on, go for a little scoop. Mmm, nice texture too. Oh, look at that. My old mother wouldn't recognise them now. <laughs> very nice. That's lovely. Well, after everything I've learnt today, I think the very least I can do is offer you a bit of refreshment. I thought you'd never ask. Well, if you give me a few minutes in the kitchen, I'll sort something out. Thank you. I think we've more than earned our tea break, a ritual that the Edwardians took rather more time over than we do today. A tea bag and a chocolate biscuit simply didn't do it. By the early 1900s, a formal sit-down tea at five o'clock was an integral part of the affluent way of life.
The most popular drink for the Edwardians was the same as it is for us today, tea. But when it came to what they had with their tea, well, I think they had us beat. They were masters of the art of baking and loved to knock up scones, biscuits and all sorts of what they called tea breads. And I'm going to make two of the best and easiest of those for tea today, starting with what were rather sweetly called pikelets. They should turn out like miniature crumpets and are made with a combination of strong bread flour and plain white flour, into which goes a little yeast activated with warm water. It's all mixed together to make a smooth, thick, glossy batter, which is then left to stand. It takes an hour or so for the yeast to do its thing, after which a second raising agent is added, bicarbonate of soda. This is dissolved in lukewarm milk, just enough of it to thin the yeast batter to the consistency of thick paint. It's all stirred vigorously together and left to stand for a few minutes while I whip up another Edwardian tea time treat, drop scones. Beat an egg into a blend of plain flour, bicarbonate of soda, cream of tartar and a pinch of salt. Add just enough milk to get that thick paint effect again and stir in a drizzle of runny honey and a generous handful of raisins. Into this batter, grate the zest of a lemon and give it all a final stir. Both drop scones and pikelets are cooked on a very hot greased griddle or you can use a heavy based frying pan. A generous tablespoon of the batter makes a drop scone which should be turned after a minute or so when the underneath is a rich golden brown. My pikelets are bite sized morsels but it takes a little longer than you think for the yeast batter to cook through. Turn them when the bubbles on the top are nearly dried out and serve piping hot with butter and perhaps a trickle of honey. Hungry, Darren? Very. Good. Ooh, very dainty. Pikelets. Mm. You can't beat a proper tea. The perfect way to introduce just a hint of decadence into an afternoon of domesticity. Have a drop scone. Oh, I'll take two. <laughs> you can take as many as you like. <laughs> okay. Really nice. Mm. I think you've got a Put in a little bit of graft to justify a tea like this. Yeah. <laughs> I think we earned ours today. Do they keep well? Mm. I'm afraid not. We've got to eat all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and Edward the Seventh relied entirely on a very good tailor. 